Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dipangi Saitya. I welcome you all to the 20th monthly online guest lecture organized by the research scholar of the School of Sanskrit Philosophy and Indic Studies at Goa University. Our guest and speaker for today, Dr. Amita Balmiki. Uh, before we begin, I would like to inform you that all the participants that the event along with the contents in the chat box is being recorded. All the participants are requested to keep their microphone on mute throughout the lecture, which will be go on about 60 minutes. After that, there will be a discussion, a Q&A session. I now um, invite Ms. Diksha to kindly introduce the speaker and give the welcome address. Over to you, Diksha. Anticipated online guest lecture philosophy and film. Today we have hosting an exceptional academician. Valmiki to guide us through the intriguing intersection philosophy and Amita Valmiki is an associate professor and head of philosophy at Ram Nirajan of Arts. Profound knowledge, education, contribution to the professor. The interchange between society with a special focus on mysticism. Dr. Valmi is currently pursued taking a report where she has presented papers at conferences, seminars, and colloquiums in more than two countries. Dr. Valmi has been admitted twice to a research fellowship in the Horizon and to share as visiting faculty at the Department of Philosophy and Study and Professor Sanjo at Goa University. A special welcome to all the faculty members at Goa University. To all the research scholars and students, I extend my heartfelt welcome. Finally, a warm welcome to all participants from both within and outside Goa University. Your presence here makes this gathering a truly diverse event. Without further ado, let us embark on this enlightening journey with Dr. Amita as our guide. Thank you and enlightenment. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Now I request Dr. Balmiki kindly deliver your lecture. Okay. So on the, uh, at the very outset, I'm extremely thankful to School of Sanskrit Philosophy and Indic Studies, Goa University, Professor Koshi uh, Tarakan, a very good friend of mine. Uh, Shanjurat Madam, uh, whom I know from quite a long time, and uh, all the faculty members, all the senior teachers, all the uh, student friends, and uh, all the people who are gathered over here. Um, this is a big honor to me, I feel, and uh, uh, sometimes I feel, do I deserve this? Um, this subject, particularly philosophy of film, uh, we are not talking at present philosophy in film, which is different from off film. In the topic that I have selected is uh, philosophy and film. Um, there are philosophers who say that philosophy cannot be without film and film cannot be studied without philosophy. And uh, uh, at this juncture, we are, of course, uh, thinking of uh, serious filmmakers who have a uh, completely, you know, use the aesthetic realm, the aesthetic field, um, of, um, you know, to convey what are their inner philosophical point of views are about life, about universe, about one's own existence and about phenomena. So the whole uh, being uh, as such is uh, um, they have poured out their um, heart and soul into it. And uh, they were also affected with the existing political, social, economic, cultural, religious, 
all walks of life that had affected them directly or indirectly. Especially, for example, in current situation, we have big names like Zafar Panahi. A um, few years back, the person, the Iranian philosopher, uh, sorry, uh, director who expired, Abbas Kirostami, or you have Majid Majidi. We are very lucky to have these people who have rebelled using the medium of uh, film uh, to convey, um, giving, giving some social message or something. But what is all film about? What is the ontological position of cinema? That, uh, this particular subject, so we are talking about ontology of film. That is, what is film all about? Why do we need to philosophize film? Um, it was considered always from the very beginning as something that entertains. Uh, it was made as a, and it was known to people as a techn technological advancement in, uh, uh, in, in um, uh, the communication media and uh, the audio visual, audio much later, but visual effect that it gave the live uh, picture that was coming on the silver screen that amazed people. So at the time of the inception itself of cinema in late 19th century, already people started philosophizing film. But uh, um, it was not in a formal pattern that it was done. Much later, uh, that means around, uh, say, uh, um, 1920, so late 20th century, um, uh, 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 yeah, it was 1980, sorry, that in the late uh, 20th century, they started formally philosophizing film. So initially, because they were, there was a lot of confusion among, among people that how, how can you feel? philosophize film because philosophy uh, uh, films were not at par with painting as a visual art form or was not like opera or the cathedral so we find that theorizing and philosophizing about films is not as old as theorizing and philosophizing about other forms of art say painting music dance theater even court jesting as was found in the olden times in a monarch's king's um, you know court to entertain. And the gesture was considered an artist to entertain king and the people. Now it was late 20th century, as I told you, around 1980s, that it took a giant leap and it came, films came as a real big art form and a serious art form. So, um, the, uh, but all the time, a uh, film was portraying something like uh, the political scenario, the economic condition, the social scenario, which was very, very prevalent and imperialism, colonization, uh, a country like India, caste and uh, religious uh, distinctions and all these things, uh, cultural um, and race and etc. People were, were you, they wanted a mu medium that would directly affect people and also the geographical conditions and most importantly and which was never given up that was the aesthetical element to entertain to educate or rebel or revolt against the existing system so we find that people started thinking of cinema as a very potent medium but we are not as i told you concentrating on philosophy in film, because every film has some philosophy behind it. Take any commercial film also. There will be also always a story, uh, something that is being told. But what is exactly film all about um, um, is what we are going to discuss in this particular talk. So the role played by cinema has been stupendous from the time of its inception. It is the cultural depiction on the screen that films are influenced by the existing culture. But once produced, it affects the audience's psyche and brings forth desirable, of course, uh, who is to decide undesirable or desirable that remains subjective. And these changes in the society as well, which are very explicitly seen. So always it is uh, film takes some something, some material from actual life incidences and when it is portrayed on the silver screen, it has a direct impact on people. 
it may come in 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 the in the way of uh, uh, what is in vogue uh, fashion you say um, um how to how to get ready how to speak how to walk how to talk how to deal with situation it affected people and it is still doing the same till date so the theories of film are very important um, um uh, part of philosophizing film, important component of philosophizing films, and places film at par with other forms of art, which requires us to philosophize films in not in so called, like Husserl says, you require a different method in philosophy. In the same way, the theorists uh, in in uh, in the world of cinema also thought that. We require a philosophical method, not which is used regularly in philosophy, but some other faculty of our mind. We have to use it to theorize films. So what do theories of film do? Now, this is well justified in the following quotation. Um, the clip that you see uh, below, I mean, the still that you see, the image you see is from Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon, which was a path breaking film. Um, which was uh, completely uh, show. It was a crime thriller, and um, people were completely taken aback. And it was so much of existential. Uh, um, uh, the film was based on existentialism, that everybody is uh, is narrating a particular incident from their own perspective, uh, including one who is committing the crime, and. Uh, this was path breaking. So what happened was, as it is mentioned in Stanford Encyclopedia, in one sense, however, philosophers need not justify their interest in film. For philosophical aesthetics has always had concern, not just with art in general, but with specific art forms. So film was, they said that why not film at par with other art forms? Uh, beginning with Aristotle's poetics, a work devoted to explaining the nature of Greek tragedy, philosophers have sought to explain the specific characteristics of each significant art form of their culture. Now, from this point of view, there is no more reason to question the existence of a philosophy of film than there is that of a philosophy of music or a philosophy of painting. Two fields that are well accepted as components of aesthetics so if you go to Vatican and you see Sistine Chapel and you see Michelangelo and you see Raphael and you see host of frescoes, uh, uh, you know, painters uh, on the um, uh, pl pl plastered wall or maybe a dry wall and uh, you see these frescoes and these uh, iconic paintings you find of romanticism to dark romanticism era, the fluctuation which took place in Europe. Paintings were always considered and studied philosophically. Uh, same happened even with theater. You know, uh, that also went on because theater was also one of the medium which was which is age old and uh, music was always there. So like Yehudi Menion, uh, the violinist, uh, uh, the Israeli violinist, he always uh, narrated. He said that uh, music people understand because from the womb of a mother, uh, you know, the child is learning the rhythm of the heartbeat of the mother first felt, and then his own heartbeat or her own heartbeat, the fetus's heartbeat. And the rhythm is caught immediately. As soon as the child comes to this world and is born, and you find that there is always rhythm, rhythm in the cradle and um, the wind blowing and you know uh, the the lullabies which are sung there is constant rhythm um, you know uh, around the child and therefore understanding music or reading music is not a big problem or feeling music is not a big problem so music was always philosophized starting from the old you know medieval opera also and paintings as you know the cave paintings of uh, uh, the primitive man and from there it started and then you have a very sophisticated ones uh, which came in Babylonian and Mesopotamian including the Incan and the Mayan civilization you find 
paintings were always there. Even Norwegians had um, so much of similarity with uh, Aryans who, who came uh, to India. And we find that uh, uh, paintings were always uh, at the same time uh, philosophized. But it did not happen. So the philosophers thought that why not films? Because it, it is a very powerful medium and we need to philosophize it. So films can, in fact, display philosophical concepts more clearly and definitely. If you feel like you want to convey the Marxist point of view, films are a very powerful medium that we will see in theories of film or feminist point of view or maybe a um, complete, uh, complete social scenario that you want to show or you want to bring about some kind of reformation in the society or you even want to revolt against it, uh, the, so, the norms which are there in society or the structure which is there. So political changes are to be brought and people found that films can do in a much be better manner than any other form of art. Because audiovisual has always been very catchy. Visuals, according to uh, educationists also, academicians also, that visual effect has a very powerful effect on the child's mind than any other um, way of teaching the child. Therefore, in school, we start A for apple and they draw apple. Uh, they, they, they structure the whole thing accordingly. So in, in fact, in the real, if the real comes, that means the mundane world, the empirical world comes clearly through documentaries. The real with R capital, you just take up certain significant uh, thing from that particular. Uh, I want to, I was just discussing with my colleague in uh, uh, college, Dr. Rina Puradkar. I said, for example, when the real, the R small signifies uh, the Vyavharika Satta, the empirical world that that is being um, we see through documentaries. But when you when you transcend that level and when I want to show my mind completely confused, what I will do is that I'm just working mechanically. These days I am confessing I'm working mechanically and uh, uh, st structuring syllabus and filling up these forms and doing this and that. So I said as a filmmaker, I will not show how I'm working like a documentary shows, but what I will do is I will just show a switchboard. And like somebody switches on me, I start working, somebody switches off at night, I just sleep. So a filmmaker selects a particular thing which doesn't happen in documentary. So according to Mary Leach, I quote her, film like other forms of fictions can never even make the transition to philosophical thinking easier. A movie can be an effective tool for introducing a philosophical to topic because it allows the viewer to drop many preconceived notions. We are all used to suspending our common sense views about how the world works in the context of fiction. This suspension can be used to the philosopher's advantage. And this is what, what happens in cinema that, uh, as I told you, you select a particular thing. And uh, when, when you are just neglecting other things and taking up one particular thing, it is, believe me, it is not a symbol or a cipher. It is not a sign of something. It is me, existentially speaking. So this is a very powerful um, you know, way of conveying what philosophy the director holds. So philosophy of film is more a branch of pure aesthetic, at aesthetics. Never at, a, never at any moment this is given up. So suppose I am, I'm, um, I will give you a very good example that uh, um, in a film, um, the heat, it's too much of a confusion in the mind of a woman in uh, the film uh, Meghi Dhakatara by directed by Ritwik Ghatak. And uh, uh, the protag female protagonist is so sad and she's so hurt by whatever is happening with her and around her that after, um, you know, um, going down the staircase of her sister's uh, uh, building, um, so much of confusion. But instead of showing the female protagonist, in one kitchen, in the in one house, there is a kitchen, and 
in the kitchen, um, uh, somebody is, uh, you know, uh, um, that means just putting vegetables in, in oil, boiling oil, and whatever sound is coming, uh, that was enough to say that what is going on in the mind of the female protagonist. So this is very useful uh, and powerful way of showing that what the person thinks, the actor, actor thinks. And philosophy of film, therefore, is a pure branch of aesthetics. The pure aesthetics imbibes in itself, as we say, very broadly speaking, I'm saying, in Indian philosophy, like morality, purity, and beauty, that is Satyam, Shivam, and Sundaram, or in Plato's terminology, the good, that is truth, beauty, and justice. So what we find is, uh, this is again very significant. The value of aesthetic sets paradigm for other values like love, compassion, humility, even anger towards injustice, which is called in Sanskrit Rudra. That I um, I remember uh, Arjun says to Krishna um, that give me that anger uh, that you have against uh, whatever injustice is happening in front of you, you should be angry. And if you don't do that, then how... Um, how, what I will do next, what is my dharma, I will not realize. So realizing this, this kind of anger, which you have to install in me. So this can be, uh, film can be a potent medium. This happened in painting. You, for example, you take, uh, of course, contemporary art, and then you take Pablo Picasso's Gurnika. Now in World War II, uh, uh, when a small town of Spain, Gurnika, uh, was uh, bombarded and um, it was completely shattered and Picasso saw this and he painted Gurnika and uh, he titled this painting. I've seen this original painting in uh, Barcelona in Picasso Museum and you find it's not, not a large painting like Fernand Leje's paintings. It is a large painting but not as big as many other artists have painted. Uh, and again, this painting is in black and white, but it conveys such a powerful message that what can war do? And you find a bull and a human, uh, um, you know, uh, dismembered bodies and the head of the horse and leg and hands and, you know, shattered life. And when you see this, you really feel that pain, that agony of war. And this is so beautifully brought out by just one painting, Gurnika. Imagine if you have nearly one and a half hour or two hours cinema that is going on in front of me on war. For example, Andrei Tarkovsky's Ivan's childhood, you realize that what can war do? And you come out completely spellbound and you are, you are stuck in that time and you are feeling that moment and this brings about the change so often when it, these days also when i'm watching news there are tears rolling out you know my from my eyes and i feel we have not learned anything so aren't we going actually backward cinema can bring this change in one one's existence so films are backed by film theories to be more precise Film theories are in a better position to analyze films and can offer a reflective avenue to young minds. As explained in Stanford again, I quote from there, the philosophy of film is a rapidly growing subfield of contemporary philosophy of art. Although philosophers were among the first academics to publish studies of the new art form in the early decades of the 20th century, the field did not experience significant growth until 1980s when a renaissance occurred. There are many reasons for the field's recent growth. Suffice it to say here that changes in both academic philosophy and the cultural role of the movies in general made it imperative for philosophers to take film seriously as an art form on a par with the more traditional ones like theater, dance, and painting. 
So they started doing it and they considered cinema equal to other forms of popular arts. So as a result of this surge in interest in film as a subject of philosophical reflection, the philosophy of film is now an important area of research in aesthetics. Now, again, we have to distinguish between many things. So uh, a short history that how um, um, film uh, took leap one after another and the technical advancement which took place and how the film theories also changed accordingly. So when we talk of film and the potentials of film and filmmaking, philosophizing film is quite intriguing and therefore requires a specialized personnel to do it. Since film as an art form itself was initiated in 1890s, and it was up to 1927 that silent films were produced. Sound was introduced after 1927. So philosophizing films has been a new philosophy that took some baby steps in the early 1920s. But some major substantial work was done in philosophizing films and propagating theories of films in 1980s. The need to philosophize film was felt seriously in last few decades as the medium of film took giant steps in expressing the fast changing socio cultural, economic, political, and creative realms. Uh, twice I repeated one sentence, excuse me for that. So here you see our great masters from Socrates to um, Aristotle and all the philosophers, they are wearing 3D glasses, uh, that too in different colors. <laughs> Now, what does it mean to theorize film? <coughs> Excuse me. So film theory is a completely an academic field where films are generally categorized. So as I told you, there's alter theory, there is Marxist theory, there is screen apparatus theory, um, there is feministic theory, psychoanalytic theory, where nowadays we, Jacques Lacan's theory is very much discussed that how it is introduced in cinema. Now, the theories try to bring out the essence of film, exploring and investigating the various facets of cinema to interpret cinema and to bring out its relevant connection to reality. It also tries to bring forth the Socratic concept, which I like very much to explain, a Platonic idea and Aristotelian form of cinema. So the way they had characterized or they had put features of a, concept or idea or form um, the teacher uh, passed on to the student in succession that we find the same ideology comes up in cinema also. So film theory is more often studied as other arts and sciences for the sheer pleasure of knowing. And this makes it a philosophy of film. So we are not doing philosophy in film because it was always there and you always read films and stories, etc. But uh, here you are seeing something and it is just a sheer pleasure of knowing, knowing what is happening, knowing what can be done, knowing it is not this and knowing the most important part is to what to unlearn. So. We are learning from philosophy of film what to unlearn. And unlearning is very important because philosophy of film, for the first time, it said this is not the way you define art. It remains subjective. Otherwise, also art remains subjective. But at the same time, what paradigms you have set, now you see that there is another methodology of this new art form that you can philosophize. And this is this gives you a pleasure that it is amazing. It is a Pandora's box that how how much you can know from that. And often it happens that man seems to be so small. Human being seems to be so small in front of this universe. And when I when I see films like Gravity or Interstellar or you know such kind of films, uh, even Matrix or etc. I feel that we are so small in this front of this universe that the universe cannot think of me where I can think of the universe at this moment. And this is presented by cinema. So you can imagine the joy of knowing 
that how much cinema can explore and take you beyond. So therefore, though philosophizing film is a new venture, theories of film is as old as 19th century. And the silent films were in its radar. So starting from a philosopher like Henry Boxon's Matter and Memory, where he says he was anti-reductionist. And uh, as you all know, as being part of philosophy family, that uh, uh, students of philosophy we all are. And we find that Boxon said uh, uh, that you can, he, he had quite similar to, I find somewhere similar to Donald Davidson's uh, anti-reductionist, you know, that you can't, Though it is the mind or matter or memory, for example, he talks about memory, that memory is in matter, in my body, in my brain, but still you cannot say it is a physical element. So it is, it is in fact spiritual. And this was followed by Rudolf Arnheim, uh, Sichfried Krakow, uh, he's often uh, very uh, mispronounced, Krakow, uh, Bella Bellasis. Uh, now these theorists put cinema on a different pedestal and claiming it to be an individual art form away from reality. But after World War II, this wave was beautiful wave, beautiful in a sense that existential issues were brought, realism was brought. And uh, the initiators and the theorists were Andre Bazin uh, claimed that cinema is the reflection of reality. Uh, he and uh, Francois Truffaut uh, started um, uh, with, a, with a journal of cinema called Carriers du Cinema. And um, uh, Novella Vogue and uh, Italian Neorealism, everything came in, in a new wave cinema. And this new wave brought about drastic change in world, uh, in world and uh, filmmakers from all over the world. Uh, especially uh, the leading one from Japan, then you find uh, from Iran and uh, also Latin American films, which came to the forefront. So one has to keep in mind that film theories are different from film studies. Film theories uh, put film and filmmakers into certain category and analyze it accordingly, as we had seen earlier. While film studies, um, you know, um, um, they study about cinema critically, its overall social impact and vice versa. Now, not only that, even the market uh, turnover and uh, how it affects the economy, how it affects the politics, how it affect, affects the social life, and also these things of our life affecting making of films. So if you see uh, Anurag Kashyap, he's always wanting to say something. Uh, Devdas of Sarat Chandra has uh, always been very auspicious character in front of us. But when he made Devdi, it was completely existential version of Devdas. And uh, uh, it was completely a new thing. And uh, he said the end also completely different. And nobody thought about that um, you can make films on uh, coal mafias, you know, the mine uh, mafias. And uh, you find he made gangs of Vasipur. And this came out strongly. He also made Black Friday, which is, they are all docu-feature uh, films. And this is something like as if you're watching a documentary, uh, not letting out or letting go its aesthetics. So this is the difference between film study and philosophizing films. Now here you can see in the silent era film, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, um, you find this film was produced in 1919, but literally see the, uh, uh, you know, the section that is made between uh, in the space and the way um, uh, a character who is uh, um, uh, on the wall with a body in the hand. Now, this is, of course, a studio uh, version, but uh, um, I find it so intriguing to see that way the space is being looked into. And uh, we will see later that how um, Stanley Cavell describes it, another film theory. So let us plunge into some of the film theories that I have taken, which I like very much personally. One is the Euter theory. Uh, um, Miss Vidya, please let me know when I'm to, supposed to stop. Okay? Sure, ma'am. Yes. 
yeah please let me know because we have to discuss also <laughs> yeah so i we have the first one i have time isn't it yes ma'am of course yeah okay so we take the first theory which is called as the author theory this is a french word author which means author the way author is for a piece of literature you find the director plays the same role in a film now author theory was very much appreciated by andre bazin and francois truffaut then later filmmakers came um, uh, from germany fassbinder you have swedish uh, you have in mark bergman uh, andre tarkovsky in, in some way if it fits into this in some ways not in all ways then we have the great master one of my favorite ones and that is satyajit ray and um, also to certain extent ritvik ghatak uh, gautam ghosh we have from india adur gopalakrishnan now it is completely their medium now you find bimal roy was one such in hindi films if you see gurudatt um in bengali of course satyajit ray then marathi cinema also came with jabbar patel who initiated with this um sham banegal we all know uh, ritvik ghatak as i mentioned uh, vijay anand uh, in popular cinema how um, philosophy and aesthetics are retained in popular cinema i think he was the first person to do that and especially his film like kala bazar and guide um, shattered the records adur gopal krishnan ketan mehta uh, gautam ghosh and many others so director is whole and soul he is the commander not only he decides or she decides about um, uh, what the uh, how the actor should act even the angle of the face uh, how much it should go how much degree it should move how they should talk everything is therefore they always took amateur actors they never took uh, uh, trained actors because trained actors will always have definitions and they will never come out from that so they always took actors who were professionally never actors they were doing something else and uh, um, they just took them and they asked them you just surrender we will manage everything so you can see Sat ray was always behind the camera and many people many technicians gave up this uh, uh, gave up um, these directors uh, working under them because um, it was never their say in the film by themselves they are also artists but here the director is the commander he is the whole and soul of the film so the film success is based on him or her and films even failure is based on uh, the director now uh, in fact they don't care about success and failure they just do it because they are convinced about the uh, not only story but about the medium and about the content they are they are convinced and they do it so and they are always into realism this is very important they always use the technique of italian neo realism which uh, um, which happened with uh, uh, this, um, um, you know um, uh, vittorio de sica's bicycle thieves by which uh, and renova's river he Uh, collaborated or rather assisted him um ria renova's uh, film river and uh, satyajit ray and uh, this had a tremendous impact on ray and uh, he was in a good field of advertising and was making money but he thought no i'm made i'm just i'm supposed to make movies and he started making films then comes uh, marxist theory of film that is obvious that it is marxism um you have three these major you know uh, filmmakers unfortunately two of them are no more uh, mrinal sen and uh, uh, kundan shah but uh, we still have uh, uh, the great master sayyad akhtar mirza uh, who always these people uh, tried to portray marxist ideology and uh, even tarkovsky had most of the filmmakers uh, after about 1945 uh, they had marxist um, you know marxism as a ideology uh, that criss crossed film uh, medium and propagates communist ideology so as mentioned in the book understanding film marxist perspective by mike wayne he says that i quote him marxist film theory retain returns 
to film studies some of the key concepts which make possible a truly radical political understanding of the medium and its place both uh, within capitalism and against it. So when you see um, Rinal Sen's Bhuvan Shom or Mrigaya or interview, you find um, a, a, a laborer, a worker's agony, um, the middle class person or the lower middle class person, they are struggling. and. Uh, but never gave up the cinematic medium or cinematography. Uh, they never compromised on it. Um, uh, Sayyid Mirza has, uh, has the title itself says that they are they were Marxist films. Mohan Joshi Hazir Ho, Arvind Desai Ki Ajab Kahani, Albert Pinto Ko Gussa Kiyo Aata Hai, Salim Langre Pe Matro. But his last film, after that he did not make, and we are looking forward that someday he will do, and that is Naseem, which was little bit offbeat uh, from his uh, previous style of making films. But Nassim is also completely Marxist film. Uh, when you see the film, and it is about uh, 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 a family, Muslim family in Mumbai, uh, living in uh, near Masjid Bandar area. And uh, uh, they are, um, how the fear develops uh, six months prior to Babri Masjid demolition. And that fear develops and the conversation between the grandfather and granddaughter. And this conversation brings about that what is required in life. So it is not devoid of uh, soteriology or eschatology. It has full of uh, uh, theory of liberation, but within this life, uh, within this life, they want this liberation. And we also have this Kundan Shah's uh, if you remember this TV serial, uh, television serial, which was very popular uh, when I was young, I used to see that, uh, that was Nukkad. So his dark comedy, Jane Bido Yaro, is still date considered a masterpiece. It was a dark comedy on how the capitalist uh, fool people and uh, in Mumbai and um, the life of uh, the workers or Plain narrative taken from literary genre where it has a target audience. Its content is often taken from literature. So usually we have literary, literary genre, but even other art forms also like music or like uh, uh, opera or something like that. Uh, we have Satyajit Ray's movie like Pathir Ponchali based on Vibhuti Bhushan Bandopadhyay's novel with the same name or Satranj Ke Khiladi, based on Munshi Premchand's short story. Now, in contemporary times, Vishal Bharadwaj has done a really good experiment where he took William Shakespeare's plays and fitted uh, to, you know, fixated in the Indian scenario by making Makbul based on Macbeth, Omkara based on Othello, and Haider based on Hamlet. This is... Uh, it was uh, these all the films, uh, but of course the standing out film was Makbul. Um, the screen theory. Uh, the screen theory is cinematic apparatus theory. Uh, it, it also retains Marxist ideology. But the greatest part of it is uh, it creates, or I like particularly why, because the theory has, um, you know, the director or the film creates the audience. Uh, popular cinema, the audience creates the film. You see Bhojpuri films or popular Hindi cinema, also commercial cinema. What is the need? Or NRI cinema, like produced by Karan Johar and other people who, who have a target audience and what they want. So accordingly, films are made. So audience creates the film. But here it is vice versa. The film creates the audience. Uh, it happened that Garm Hava uh, was uh, completely you know, uh, curated and the reels were uh, digitalized and it was, uh, it had uh, three shows in nearby uh, mall theater. And uh, um, I was so happy because I could see this film. I did not see that at that time. I was very small when it was, um, it was uh, uh, shown. Um, it came into theaters at that time. But um, uh, when I saw here in the theater on a big screen, um, we were about 20 people who came to the 
theater to see this film. And uh, afterwards, we were four. After 15 or 20 minutes, we were four people who were watching this film. So this film creates an audience that I don't want to move from here. And uh, uh, this is why screen um, ap cinematic apparatus theory is retaining Marx Marxist ideology. It creates the audience. Um, so uh, it has so powerful uh, content that some of them don't want to move away, even in the, in the interval time. So one can imagine to what height a film can go to and bind the viewers with the screen. Filmmaker M.S. Satyu's film Garm Hava is one apt example. It also propagates Marxist ideology and secularism within Indian context. Satyu's another movie which hardly uh, I have seen that most of the people don't know about this, that uh, one of the earlier movie, earliest actually movies of uh, um, uh, Anil Kapoor was Kaha Kaha Se Guzar Gaya. Uh, this had a strong uh, Marxist uh, content into it. A boy of a capitalist and uh, how he ventures into, you know, becomes a Naxal and becomes a social reformer, but he's not finding peace anywhere. And how ulti ultimately he just comes back to where he was. And beautifully crafted. So Satyu always did that. And you can go on YouTube and listen to his interviews. He's still as young in his ideas and thoughts as he was making these films at that time. Um, this is a unique uh, you know, um, um, theory. This is the formalist film theory. Uh, very few Indian filmmakers in, in Europe and America, they have done a lot of experiments with this. They said a film is a visual medium, visual art. So Usually how, what is the role of light? What is the role of um, shades? What is the role of makeup? What is the role of costume? What is the role of space and time? All these things mattered a lot for them. So like designing, sound, lighting, editing, color, treatment, score, etc., music, everything was, was, was formalized. Like you are watching a painting in movement. So this is something completely a different genre. We we had only two of them who made such kind of movies, Mani Call and Kumar Sani, who did it. So for them, uh, uh, maybe um, there is a there is a rope in the corner of the uh, room is equally important as the male or a female protagonist. The wall, perforated wall, is equally important, like a tree on the courtyard, in the courtyard. So the bus or the vehicle or anything that you find, they all hold importance. And they are placed and structured in such a way that you feel like you are reading uh, Tractatus, you know, Wittgenstein's. Um, and you find that it is also structured. So uh, somewhere it reminds you of um, uh, atomism theory of uh, analytic philosophers like Russell and Moore. And uh, you find that it is it is more the structured way, linguistic analysis. This is visual analysis. And uh, they produce films like Uski Roti, Ashadka Ek Din, Duvida, Drupad. Now, Kubar Sani's movie like Maya Darpan, Khayal Gatha, Tarang, Kasba. I've seen these movies. And when I saw them for the first time, I was completely, uh, completely taken aback that what is actually happening and i had to see this for 10 times and then realize that what still i i I'm taking the grip of it you know because it was amazing the way they did it and they experimented and they had taken so much of risk also at the same time then you find the psychoanalytic film theory um of course, Sigmund Freud becomes prominent, but today, as I told you, Jacques Lacan is also, even Carl Gustav Jung, uh, their, their uh, for, uh, analysis, psychoanalysis is being um, seen in the film. And film were based on that. So Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory where analysis of human mind is depicted in a film, that the audience can read the why and how of the characters portrayed in a film. Films like Kora or Bissal Bad, directed by Biren Nag. Um, I especially appreciated Kora, which was based on Alfred Hitchcock, another oiter, 
uh, uh, in the world of filmmaking. Um, it was based on um, Hitchcock's Rebecca. And uh, Miren Nag did a fantastic job um, how, how it was translated into Indian uh, situation. And uh, it was um, sometimes when you read reviews, these reviews are uh, actually uh, not right ones because they say there is so, some supernatural element. There is no supernatural element, actually. When you see Rebecca also, you feel you know very well because none of the Hitchcock's film has uh, given anything that is supernatural, ghost or anything like that. It is always or apparition. It is always human mind that is projecting everything. And you also see uh, Diva Aryas Chopra, which was a popular cinema, but I enjoyed very much because that, uh, um, you know, segregation of id ego and super ego was explicitly shown. Amitabh did a fantastic job as usual. Then Ram Gopal Verma in today's time has done a lot of work on this. Uh, though uh, his, uh, his uh, film as as a film, creative success is always debatable. Um, how much creative he was, artistic uh, artistry it is there. We don't know, but he did a lot of work on this, and he also had taken a lot of risk, like producing films like Company or Satya, which were very good. But later on, it deteriorated. You find um, Satkun Maaf by Vishal Bharadwaj, a clear-cut psychoanalytic film that how a person thinks and portraits. The most famous that you find uh, of uh, uh, Hitchcock's film, that is uh, Psycho. Uh, every film lover must see this because it's an iconic film and therefore based on psychoanalytic theory. The feminist fil film theory has two uh, aspects. One is that how women are or uh, females are used as a commodity, a uh, selling commodity, and uh, how they are being projected and how um uh, as a female i i object to that because uh, how do you do this why do you do this and other way also of looking at it like um um uh, bimal roy made uh, bandini or sujata i find they quite feminist movies and especially bandini and um uh, where uh, power of women emancipation and ideology, feministic ideologies are being shown. So you find Aparna sends Paroma and Sati, uh, Sai Paranjapes, uh, Sparsh and Shaz, <coughs> Mira Nayars, uh, you find Kama Sutra, A Tale of Love or Mississippi Masala, Deepa Mehta, of course, you all know very well about fire, earth, and water. And um, uh, his fire was um, one, one completely, you know, um, first time you could see this in Indian, <coughs> in India or in Indian cinema, uh, though he, she's Canadian now. Now, Mehboob Khan's Mother India, a popular cinema, even today it is being appreciated world over and other films, as you see. I found one film which was in 80s, <coughs> Nika by B.R. Chopra. B.R. Chopra always made films based on social issues. And Nika was one such feminist movie. So in the world over, you have marriage of Maria Brown, or you have uh, the schoolmaster's wife. Uh, these are quite feminist movies of Fassbinder. Then you have uh, what Stanley Cavell has to say, one of the film uh, who be believes in uh, realism in cinema. Uh, <coughs> So though as esteemed a philosopher as Stanley Cavell has disputed it, it seems clear to me, as to many others, that film is the contemporary art form. Number one, Avin Pontfosky, um, you find notes that it is the movies that mold more than any other single force, the opinions, the taste, the language, the dress, the behavior, and even the physical presence of a public comprising more than 60% of the population of the earth. So film is a new art form that came into being uh, through the wonders of modern technology, like opera in the 19th century and the cathedral in the 13th uh, century. Film is indeed the contemporary Gesamtkunst. It's a German word, which means the synthesis or coming together of integration, that is, of many art forms. In Mark Bergman, 
remarked that film is the contemporary equivalent to the medieval cathedral, which drew together artists and artisans from all sorts of, uh, um, um, from various fields of life, architects, stained glass, stained glass uh, designer, uh, sculptors, mural painters, liturgists, composers, and musicians, along with masons and hoard carriers as well. So you find that uh, uh, they are all very important. And all these art forms come together, the Samkunst, and uh, they make a movie. So uh, these art forms are um, uh, completely integrated into, in, into cinema. And therefore, cinema becomes a very distinct art form. I know how to give the meaning of a word, um, but not uh, uh, how to give the intention of the word, as uh, said by Stanley Cavill, which the audience always has to find out. So sometimes uh, when uh, with students, when I'm watching a movie and then in the end they say, some we just we are quiet and then uh, they ask the question that what was there in this movie so i said you tell me what was there in the movie because i can't read your mind uh, you have to read your mind and um, this is how it works so um, uh, you cannot bring out the intention of the word you can give the word but cannot do this and therefore though he believed in realism in cinema Stanley Cavell differed from Andre Bazin, who believed that um, only director is important, while Cavell believed realism only. But he said other artists, technicians are also equally important. This was the difference between them. So film draws together script writers, directors, actors, cameramen, lighting specialists, set and costume designers, musicians, special effects, experts, and stagehands. Its peculiarity is that it has the power to make us universal warriors, to make us present in a way impossible in real life, to every mode of human action and to expand our vicarious experience to any real or fictitious visual and audio space. Our intention is to focus upon the nature of the film medium and the peculiar possibilities that it affords. Um, we will approach the study by a double method, a phenomenological inventory um, as it is. We take it a phenomena as it is rather than judging and rather than defining or rather being opinionated. And a comparison with other cognate art forms, the comparison with other art forms, most especially as we have already done, like Gurnika, painting, theater and novel will show the peculiarities of film. So this was said by uh, Cavell, and it is mentioned in by in a book, um, Philosophy Film Journal, um, sorry, in a journal. The article was named Toward an Ontology of Film, a Phenomenological Approach by Robert Wood. So here you see the still is from um, Sacrifice from um, Andrei Tarkovsky's film. So uh, a film may belong to one or more film theory, for instance, M.S. Satyu's film Garm Bhava. I wanted to uh, show this uh, if I can just, I can just try for us for a few seconds. And if it doesn't work, then we can move forward. <laughs> गीता की कोई सुनता न कुरान की सुनता हैरान सा ईमान वहाँ भी था यहाँ भी आज किसे छोड़ा है भैया बड़ी बहन को बहनों इस आप तो पहले ही कराची जा चुके थे आज उनके बाल बच्चे नहीं चले Wasting 
भागे हैं उनकी सजा उन्हें क्यों दी जाए जो ना भागे हैं और ना भागना चाहते हमें हिंदुस्तान से भागना नहीं बल्कि हिंदुस्तान में रहकर आम आदमी के कांधे से कांधा मिलाकर अपनी मांगों के लिए लड़ना चाहिए just a second so this is uh, one of the powerful movie which has uh, almost all the theories of cinema it was oida theory it was feminist theory it was uh, there was a um, 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 find a genre theory to certain extent because it took uh, the genre of uh, uh, social realism that um, in the, what happened during 1947 uh, and um, to muslim uh, muslims in india and who never intended to go uh, and leave india and they were so much with and for india and this was marxist theory uh, cinematic apparatus theory uh, formalistic to certain extent because uh, the lokal which satya has selected has uh, unique formalism into it so you find that there are an even psychoanalytic theory so there are some most of the films uh, serious films which are made in contemporary times are completely uh, based on all these theories and genres of film now just have a, um, a vidya do i have 10 minutes yes ma'am five, five uh, okay you can yeah. speak for 15 more minutes okay so because i wanted to uh, uh, explain some philosophical theories and theorists view on cinema uh, we will take another one. So, uh, Rudolf Arnheim, a film theorist, was favoring, and all through his lifetime, because he lived almost, you know, uh, some 96 years old he was when he expired in, in 2000 somewhere. And his, his, uh, he had seen from silent era uh, to uh, talkies and to color Eastman and then Technicolor and then virtual cinema. He had seen all, and anime as well of uh, Japanese, uh, you know, cartoons, etc. He saw all these genres of cinema and uh, he found ultimately he came to the same conclusion that uh, the silent era was the best because his very popular statement is uh, that that uh, um, choices are with mediocre artist. Uh, genuine artist has no choice. And therefore, you have a limited medium. There is no color. There is no sound and you have to have only, you have only this much medium and how to give your best to convey your thoughts. For example, films uh, by um, uh, Einstein, uh, uh, Sergei Einstein, that is a Russian, he was a German, uh, Rus Russian filmmaker, the way he used montage because in silent era and to give an effect to the film of the how civil war in Russia, in Soviet Union, uh, in Russia at that time, and then Soviet Union, and then the war, how it devastates the life of people. And especially the scene where, uh, um, you know, um, the pram of a child is going down when when um, uh, there, there is, a, you know, um, um, uh, cannons are being, uh, you know, uh, 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 throwing balls of fire and the cradle comes down and that scene is, you know, it devastates one, it, it shatters one. And he had so much uh, um, less medium, you know, so much less, uh, um, um, uh, how do you call instruments to express his uh, uh, ideas on war, but he did it so well because he had limited means to show on the on the on the on the screen so for anheim literary figures cannot be mechanically transferred into film figures however the director can become an artist who will depict to us the world not as it is objectively but it has to show something more because uh, the means are very limited so but subjectively as well what i am feeling personally about war 
and that he is showing. So he is in a position to create new realities, evoke magical worlds, and build symbolic bridges between facts and things that lack any direct ties in real life. So we find he is saying, Arnheim's provocative thesis is that the peculiar virtues of films as art derived from an exploitation of limitations of the medium. Uh, you can see Rustam Dotiwala's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, still from the film, uh, Bilva Mangal. And uh, you find he's using as much as possible. So uh, things where he had limitations and how best he can show what he wanted to show. Therefore, Anheim believed that as soon as talkies came, those filmmakers who were making silent films completely deteriorated. They, in fact, they were, they were no more artists or filmmakers. Uh, he gave the example of Charlie Chaplin. So Charles Chaplin, he said, he did this. When he made talkies, it, of course, I, I liked all his films, but he said when he made talkies, the essential uh, Chaplin was missing out. So the limitation of the medium, the absence of sound, the absence of color, the lack of three-dimensional depth, film, silent film artists made virtues of these necessities and were on their way to developing a new and distinctive art form. Because they didn't have these, these limitations, they in fact made virtues of it. They, they saw to it that how other things can be used like montage, editing, fast cuts, deep shots, and at the same time, it will take you back. So this was very important. Mechanical advancement, he says, has led to greater realism, but unfortunately, he says, correspond, corresponding loss in artistry. So this is his take on cinema. So Arnheim's aesthetic theory before belongs with the traditional aesthetic theories of film. His specific approach to film is aesthetically founded on the principles of silent film. He advocates film as an art and in that context doesn't trust technical advances too much. <clears throat> He's convinced that the development of technical achievements drastically decreases distinguishing factors such as uh, uh, closes the gap between the film image and the real. Natural image actually decreasing the space of developing originality and thus narrowing the area available for artistic achievement in cinematography. <coughs> Excuse me. So seeing consists of the grasping of structural features rather than the indiscriminate recording of details. So he's saying film medium is not documentary or not photography. Film feature films are actually saying about the same things for documentaries or photographs say. Uh, but, but the thing is that they pull out only the essential part in limited way how they use the best the medium of making film and this is something that produces in front of you another world which is objective in nature but completely subjectively understood and this subjectivity just touches the core of your heart so this is Anheim's take on cinema Bazi was, on the other hand, he was very much impressed by uh, uh, existentialism as philosophical, uh, but I will not say theory because they themselves did not like existentialists. But by existentialism, they were highly influenced. Stanley Cavell was also believing in realism in cinema. They were influenced by, as I told you, Italian neorealism, which was portraying world as it is. But in their unique way. So there is a signature mark of the director on it. So important for Andre Bazin were deep focus like Orson Welles in America, from America, wide shots like Jean Renova and wide shots in continuation for a long time. And the shot in depth uh, preferred a true continuity. Uh, so editing was very less. They did use montage, but it was an editing, but it was very less. So instead of editing and visual effects, they used continual, you know, camera focus. 
Though film theories in 1920s and 1930s emphasized how cinema could manipulate reality, he came in opposition to this view. Let the spectator decide, he believed, films to be watched personally. He was influenced by the theory of personalism. Now, what is personalism for Bazin was film should represent a director's personal vision because like the painter is to painting, like the author is to a piece of literature in the same way director is to cinema. So director's personal signature mark should be there. That what director understands by this particular content which he has, he has portrayed in the cinema. Bazet preferred long takes to montage editing, believed as less as possible is important than as more as possible. And this also I like very much. Therefore, narrative was key to great film. And therefore, there is some kind of story lying behind. In formalist filmmaking, you don't have. So montage is the technique of selecting, editing, and piecing together separate sections of film to form a continuous whole. So according to Andre Bazet, he says reality is not art. But a realist art is one that can create an integral aesthetics of reality. This is very important. And therefore, I, I just love uh, his theory and I love film based on Bazin's uh, uh, theory. In fact, Truffaut and when he, uh, Bazin, were, were uh, producing this journal and uh, uh, editing this journal on uh, careers do cinema, uh, Truffaut later on found that what he wrote about cinema and what they were thinking about cinema, the filmmakers are not making. And then... Um, in, in opposition to the uh, to his current or contemporary filmmakers, he started making films. So he he uh, he became a filmmaker as a as a revolt against what was happening in cinema world, and they brought about cin uh, realism, and um, uh, all over the world you find Michelangelo, Antonioni from uh, uh, Italy and uh, uh, Thomas Elia from Italy and uh, uh, from Spain, uh, I mean Cuba. And these people, they completely changed uh, making films. So according to Cavell, I quote, again, another one uh, who believes in realism, Stanley Cavell, a world complete without me, which is present to me, is the world of my immortality. So if you say a line has a starting point and a definite end, how many points you can put in on that line that is infinite. In the same way, the world is complete without me. Is actually the world, it's a world of my immortality. That is what Cavell says. And this comes out in cinema. That immortality is an importance of film and a danger as well, because my limitations, my drawbacks are also seen in that. Viewing from outside, we want the world on film rather than staking or marking our existing within it. But no harm would come from haunting the world on film were it not for the massive way in which we involve movies in our lives. So we get so much involved and each one of you who are watching cinema, when you come out of theatre, you carry for so long up to the time you reach home and then there is some kind of discussion that you come out from your world of cinema, the film that you had seen, and then you start thinking. But even uh, like Abbas Kiyostami, the uh, uh, Iranian filmmaker, he says, the Persian filmmaker, he says so beautifully that uh, I would like uh, my uh, audience to sleep um, in my films when they are watching my films. But I'm sure that they will have, even if they have seen a small or a very small part of it, I'm very sure that if they slept in my film, that's good. But I'm going, I'm 100% sure about it, that they will have many sleepless, sleepless nights afterwards. And believe me, when you see Chaos Tami's movies, this is clearly, absolutely true. When when I'm, I'm watching his movies, the film haunts me for nights. And uh, even at particular juncture, you don't want to see because it's so going in, in slow pace that you don't want to see at particular moment. But then you the whatever you have seen, it haunts you. And gradually the layers open up.
and you find the theory of resurrection, the theory of soteriology, the eschatology, and all this comes up gradually, and they and they add the beauty to the film. So viewing from outside, we want the world on film rather than staking, as I said, but we don't, it lies a danger because you see yourself naked there. The natural relation to film is to be broken. There is equal reason, reason to want to it affirmed um, that the world is coherent without me. That is essential to what I want of immortality, says Kaveh. Nature's survival of me. It means that the present judgment upon me is not yet the last. So it is an ongoing process. And here you can see uh, still from an untitled painting by um, Adam uh, Putnam. And uh, it's, it's uh, excellent. You can see here that how my limited world gives me, uh, or the world without me is complete, gives me my, the world of immortality. And you find the ongoing uh, staircases, which is in a particular limit, but it is ongoing. And the reflection, especially, of the, of the staircase. Uh, film as dreams. According to Susan Langer, she says films are like dreams. Uh, but they, are, uh, they exist now, he, she says. They exist now. So uh, for her, um, uh, what is in dream format? She says that when you read a piece of literature, uh, you are in past. When you finish a short story, reading a short story or a novel or a poem, you, when you finish it and you close the book, you go into past. When you see a play or a drama in theater, you, after seeing the play, when you come out, you are moving in the future because it was moment in time. But when you are watching a movie, it is now. It is existentially speaking, ontologically speaking, it is now. And this can happen uh, now in ad infinitum. It is limited now, but it is ad infinitum. And this can happen only in dream. Therefore, according to Langer, Langer's theory, uh, if uh, uh, Professor Ranjit Ghosh, uh, he had heard me of um, Susan Langer, uh, only on Langer I spoke, and you find that she, she speaks about this uh, so beautifully that you start believing. If you have read the book on the life of Shri Guevara, The Motorcycle Diaries, um, um, I've read the book and I've seen the film also. You literally find this Susan Langer's view, film as dream, being reflected there. So according to Langer, the most noteworthy formal characteristic of dream is that the dreamer is always at the center of it. Places shift, persons act and speak or change or fade, but the dreamer is always there. This aesthetic peculiarity, this relation to things perceived, characterizes the dream mode. It is this that the moving picture takes over and whereby it creates a virtual present. In its relation to the images, actions, events that constitute the story, the camera is in the place of the dreamer. But the camera is not a dreamer. I like this very much. We are usually agents in a dream. The camera is not itself in the picture. It is the mind's eye and nothing more. Neither is the picture likely to be dreamlike in its structure. So example, here you can see some stills from um, Motorcycle Diaries. Um, film as language, the last part. Uh, if cinema, um, you know, we find that Gregory Curie says, actually film is a language, of course, not ordinary language. So if cinema language were a language, Curie argues, this language would have to be startlingly different that we know from any natural languages which we are familiar. For one thing, this language would use only one medium, sight, whereas natural languages like English can be seen, heard or even touched in Braille, for example, that is the picture of it. Although it is difficult to define an essence of language, Curie thinks we can describe enough about natural languages through linguistics to talk about what their characteristics are and to inquire whether cinema has these characteristics. 
We should keep in mind that although he does not accept cinema as a language, Curie does agree that it is a form of communication and also that it is representational and not purely natural. So it is your world which you see and your language in which you describe. So here we find Curie's dissection or dissection of the film as language analogy is quite detailed and exacting that it remains in Descartes' terminology absolutely clear and distinct. Curie shows the given the structure of actual languages, film cannot be one. Of course, as we all know, the relation of words to their reference, for example, is different than that of picture, including moving ones of their reference. Now, here he gives an example. This, moreover, should remind us of how differently we acquire access to actual languages versus how we come to understand films. For example, a word dog, related word like dog kennel, dog bite, etc. But once this is what he says, but once we see a motion picture image of a dog and caught and catch onto the basic cinematic graphic symbolism, namely that shots represent that of which they are shots, then we are able to understand every other symbol in cinema in one fell swoop. And this is why it is considered as language according to uh, Gregory Curie. So all these uh, uh, film theorists like film uh, as re uh, realism in film or film as dream, uh, film as language or silent film, for example, are important. All this amalgamation uh, of theories can be seen in one film by Andrei Tarkovsky, that is Stalker. And uh, again, we will just uh, uh, go back to it. Зона – это очень сложная система ловушек, что ли. Но стоит тут появиться людям, как все здесь приходит в движение. Здесь исполнится ваше самое заветное желание. Самое выстроенное. This was it. These are some of the references relating a person to the whole world. That is the meaning of cinema according to Tarkovsky. You find another book, very important. For all theories, there are different books which are referred to. And ultimately, Zafar Panahi, the Iranian filmmaker who says, if you could tell a film, then why make a film? So philosophy of uh, film is not telling about the film. It is just trying to philosophize films. Thank you very much. And thank you.
Yeah, that's all. Vidya, yeah, uh, who is in charge? <laughs> Over to you, Dipanki. Thank you, Dr. Balmiki. Yeah, it was a wonderful so. talk. Yeah. Now we'll go to the uh, question and answer session. Please. I request Rajbi to conduct the Q&A session. Over to you, Rajbi. Thank you, Dipanki. Uh, good evening, one and all. We are starting with the Q&A session. So I request the participants to either type your questions in the chat box or raise your hand by clicking the button on the bottom of the screen to ask the question directly. Any questions? Yes, uh, Sir Ranjit Kosh, you may ask your question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Balmiki. Uh, as usual, she has given a very detailed exposition about the films and its relationship with philosophy. Now, uh, two things are coming out of it, according yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The first is that film as illustration is nothing but doing philosophy. Mm -hmm. this yeah. Is, this yeah. is number one. And secondly, uh, films inevitably leads to many metaphilosophical questions, which Absolutely. philosophy cannot uh, 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 just explain. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. These are the two important things which uh, goes with the uh, relationship of uh, philosophy and film, uh, that is philosophy through film. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, uh, but an, uh, another issue I want to raise, you have mentioned about so many films, uh, but uh, two things, uh, two films which are coming to my mind. One is uh, by Gautam Ghosh, that is Antar Jali Jatra. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes. That is, uh, so, uh, its impact is so wide. Yes. Uh, you find all the issues uh, simultaneously presenting in, uh, presented there. The yeah, gender yeah. issue is there. The social issue is there. So all the, the all these things are clubbed into that Gautam Ghosh's picture. Yes. And uh, another picture, we can uh, on these two points we can bring the illustration of uh, many many films. But yes. the, another film is uh, uh, Bhul Yes, one. yes, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> there uh, you find. You can, uh, if you want to the philosophize on it, you can make it as a form of thought experiment. Yes. That we yes. used to do in uh, the philosophy of mind. Yes. And, uh, and, and it is a combination of uh, psychoanalysis and uh, yes. uh, thought experiment. Yeah. So the, it, uh, from all these things, uh, the uh, concluding part of your lecture, what you have said, that that actually holds good in uh, most of the audiences that is seeing without judging yeah yes absolutely. because 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 that, that is how we make a distinction between the commercial picture and art picture art picture uh, it, it evokes a type of uh, question in our mind it, 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 it is we can philosophize on an yes, art picture. Yes. but absolutely. take the commercial picture that is uh, most uh, the, which is uh, being uh, mostly acclaimed and that is uh, uh, seeing without judging Absolutely. Uh, because uh, they, they, they used to say <laughs> so, so yeah. this is the thing so these are some of yeah, them. The problem is that uh, we need to uh, um, that is what uh, i'm going to speak uh, in uh, one of the national seminars uh, they have called as a panelist um, for uh, new national education policy, uh, we are lacking uh, art knowledge, you know, to, yeah. to given to the students because um, we can learn human values, we can uh, uh, talk about virtues and all these things, and through art forms, this can be communicated so well. And uh, sir, I would uh, like to uh, just uh, uh, bring about an anecdote of uh, in my uh, life experience. This is when I was visiting uh, Pablo Picasso's. Uh, uh, Picasso Museum uh, in Barcelona. At that time, when I was watching Gurnika, and uh, um, uh, yeah, I think yeah, one or other of his painting, um, and you, there was a uh, kindergarten children, 
were brought there and they were made to keep quiet because they were talking they said no in museum you are supposed to be quiet the teacher said and the teacher was asking the question now first of all for five minutes you see this uh, uh, painting and then talk about the painting whatever you feel such kind of experiments how many of our teachers take our students to galleries or good cinema or maybe forget about that even museums it's so very rare and uh, let us talk about art which is so uh, such a sensitive part of human existence and through which so many philosophical ideologies can be conveyed and we can improve our life but this is not being given and uh, we have to be vocal about it therefore so yeah can you unmute yourself sir i just want to add one thing and then i'll stop other speak uh, because in in uh, silent era you the you are uh, you have mentioned about chaplin's earlier films yeah yeah so i think uh, those uh, uh, films are uh, we can take as at art forms in motion pictures yeah yeah yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. but when the audio visual impact came and uh, they are actually uh, the uh, the uh, the thought started sinking yes because because uh, we we what we are seeing we are just uh, yes. um, engaging ourselves with that we yeah. never inquire so Absolutely. in silent era there was this uh, possibility of inquiring mind yes yes absolutely absolutely thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you uh Next, we have Abhita Bacon. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Abhita Bacon. Okay. Uh, CI? CI, you can ask. You. Yes, am I audible? Yes, yes. Hello, ma'am. Hello. How are you? I'm not sure if you remember me, but you taught me this paper at Mumbai University. Oh, yeah. Did I? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So, and it was almost nostalgic for me. Because, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Same the thing. Passion, <laughs> the passion with which you talk about films is, you know, it forced us to go and watch all the movies that you mentioned, uh, especially uh, wherein you mentioned that the lady walking down and the noise of the tadka, the splattering yes. of the oil. Yes, so you remember. Yeah. Like, yeah. So uh, my question now is about OTT platforms and there's so much of online uh, thing available. Do you think it's taken the thrill uh, of the movies away like earlier uh, people would watch to uh, like wait to watch a film and uh, then i think yeah. the online thing has also taken our attention spans away so we find it easier to yeah now see i'm born and brought up in that era where uh, you know 70s and i mean i was born in 1965 don't judge my uh, uh, age okay i'm still very young so uh, the thing is that uh, uh, we have seen those films from bimal roy to um, even Shole, for example, you know, at that time and, uh, um, and of course in Indian and at the same time we were seeing American movies which were very different, but um, uh, more of uh, European movies and Latin American movies. So that, that really touched me. And today I'm, I'm still very much into Persian movies. Um, uh, even Pakistan, uh, Azerbaijan is here and uh, uh, I just, uh, we had analyzed one film called Bowl. Um, see, even though I don't belong to that, I will not say it is bad. Uh, it will go on developing. And uh, let us be open to it. I, I personally don't belong to that. But that does not mean it is bad. Um, 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 see, the thing is that uh, these technical advances go on taking place. And uh, um, you can't stop that. And you are born and brought up in this time. So you are very familiar with this and you can appreciate that also. We are still um, like Satyajit Ray up to the end of his life, he used only primitive camera because he was finding it very comfortable. 
and uh, same thing is with me i still find uh, film and re fil uh, realism in film that theory very much uh, you know um, very near to my heart so uh, i still go into that new films are coming rarely i could affiliate with them um, uh, new films in 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 bollywood for example newton or uh, aligarh or uh, some such films by ansel mehta or amit masurkar or uh, uh, chinmay uh, ta, ta, uh, uh, tamane and these people youngsters are doing so i i am i belong to that genre but that does not mean that i need to criticize them and be judgmental that only that era no we have to welcome new things and we have to experiment with new things and things will go on developing so let me just uh, um say that i'm not belonging to that but i still accept it okay it is one of the platform i am critical about it because that charm is lost even the big theater charm we used to go in big theaters with lot many people sitting there and watching and today you find that um, 10 or gitos of you know <laughs> few people coming to theater and watching i don't feel uh, any affiliation to that wo wo maza nahi aata hai so i feel that uh, i'm losing that charm but because i came from that time but today's generation is moving fast so for example if i will tell you i still appreciate um, uh, talat mahmood uh, geeta dat mohammad rafi my husband is into jazz music and my son is into death metal <laughs> so you find that three genres different genres are living in the same family and we are still going happy <laughs> so this is what i want to say yeah thank you ma'am thank you we have a question in the uh, chat box ma'am uh, by yeah. vivek yadav yeah it says how does ethics factor into the process of infusing philosophical elements into films yeah uh, how does ethics factor into process of infusing philosophical elements into films um first of all uh, i want to clear one thing vivek uh, that uh, films are not social workers film is an art form now for example in formalist film making you don't have at all uh, um, uh, anything to say it is just uh, how do you call it it's just a visual form which you have to cherish so such kind of things don't come i think a filmmaker has to be honest and tarkovsky says beautifully um there are no artistic films or art films or serious cinema or parallel cinema and commercial film there is no distinction of any sort like this uh, uh he says what are good films and what are bad films in his interview you can see all over youtube small small interviews uh, and he says good films are those which are honestly made uh, because there was this inner urge in a director to make this film and bad films are made for market they are market oriented so automatically you have large masses and public in your eye and you make to earn money but uh, good films are those which are which are made out of sheer passion that there is i told you genuine artist has no choice i have to make this movie only and not that i may lose everything Fil good filmmakers have lost everything but they were determined and they said that it doesn't matter what comes what we want to make we'll make and this is how great artists have lived all through their life so ethics is that factor and this is how uh, philosophical elements uh, come into films and this is how you see films for example if you see the movie by abbas kiyostami uh, uh, his film uh, called uh, um, um, under the only uh, uh, tree uh, then you have the wind will carry us then you have the taste of cherry i mean this is mind blowing or zafar panai you take for example and these film makers are a uh, band <laughs> they were banned in their time and zafar panai is still banned he is not allowed to make movies because they took up uh, this challenge of uh, 
changing and they felt seriously the agony of women, the agony of uh, social customs which were thwarting the progress of people. And they made movies, but they did not leave Iran. They remained there. They are st uh, Zafar is still there. And they are, they say that we are rooted here. So this kind of uh, um, passion into art and aesthetics is what ethics means to me. The virtue, I mean, the virtuous life is all about. Am I clear, Vivek? OK. Mr. Azhar, thank you so much. We will be in touch, OK? Yes. Um, yeah. Rex, Matthew, kindly unmute and ask you. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, this is a very nice lecture. Uh, thank I'm you. audible, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about Susan Langer's uh, theory of film yeah. as a dream. So yeah. could we go ahead and say that uh, film also has this Freudian function, that there is wish fulfillment, that, or that it, uh, like a film, if when you watch a film, it's like if we watch a dream, like could it also, is it also a medium where our private fantasies are being uh No, 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 uh, no, Rex, no, 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 completely not. Uh, it is not uh, uh, that kind of analysis. <sighs> Uh, dream in a sense that um, when you are dreaming, you feel it is real mm. and it is actually okay. happening. But when you wake up, you realize it is not. It was not real. Right. It was just a dream. So it is happening now, but it is not having an end because it, it continues. Sometimes your uh, dream remains in your mind and it mm. never goes that I dreamt about this. So film is something like that. Uh, for example, when you are seeing uh, films by Tarkovsky or by, by Fassbinder or by uh, Vaida or uh, Ray and, or anyone, they haunt you. And uh, it, it is not psychoanalysis. Dream in a sense that it is not bringing about the unconscious out. It is not bringing unconscious out. It is something aesthetically intertwined with my ideas which I actually cannot do in real life. So in real life, when I, uh, like a stalker, who is taking uh, people to a zone, uh, which is believed to be, um, you know, some alien uh, uh, spaceship is there or something. And uh, whenever people go there, their uh, inner wish will come true. And, uh, but it can take your life also. So, but he still goes there. Why? Because he wants to earn money. And uh, this, this I cannot imagine in real life, which I see in cinema. So what happens is when you, Che Guevara's life, when you read Ernesto's life, when you read in Motorcycle Diaries, uh, you can imagine the, the way he, he managed. But, you know, when he goes to Leper Island and when he goes to, uh, you know, the way he, they travel from one uh, country to another and they move and they come and their ideological changes and how he becomes, you know, uh, a rebel and uh, fights against imperial and uh, uh, capitalist rule and then ultimately becomes uh, somewhat like Naxal and the way he was uh, being uh, captured and then killed and then three days they just kept the body to see now when you when you see his this film uh, i cannot imagine this uh, in reality as such but i can definitely think of it in my dream though it is the truth which actually happened but i still don't want to accept it but when you see on the screen it it seems like a dream which you accept everything there is no choice for you you have to accept it because it, it is your dream and it is happening in front of you. See Pater Panchali, for example. More than Pater Panchali, I liked Aparajito, the next episode of Pater Panchali. And then Apur Sansar was very good. But Aparajito was unique. Um, some things which usually appeal to me a lot. So it seems that this cannot be materialized maybe 
in my life, which I may overlook, even if it is happening, I may overlook because there are so many other things. But in cinema, uh, that can be made prominent. And that is why uh, it is a dream sequence. And it is existentially now, as if you are seeing it now. Am I clear, Mr. Matthew? Yeah, yes, yes, I, yeah, I got it. I, I, yeah. uh, so, okay, I understood it's uh, it's not in the Freudian sense, but in a different, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I, I had uh, one more question regarding Arnheim's, uh, uh, yeah. Arnheim's theory. So yeah. like, I, I understand that he thinks of constraints as you could make virtues out of constraints in the old films, yes. and that in, me yes. in mechanical with mechanical advancement, it has somehow gone away. Yes. So, but uh, yes. nowadays we have uh, yeah, nowadays yeah. we have fil filmmakers who say uh, sometimes they rely on all techniques. They use yeah, black yeah. and white in their films, but they are, yes. with mechanical advancement, we are also <laughs> in a position to now choose our constraints, right? Yeah, like yeah, I mean, yeah. as as in yeah, yeah. like isn't it yes. good in a sense that yeah, uh, it is movie... good. As I told you, this is what Arnheim's take is on cinema. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my take, for example, my special genre is alter theory and film realism in cinema. Right, I, I belong to that. I like that films. That does not mean uh, films which are, you know, uh, feminist movies or which are um, um, Marxist movies, I don't like. No, I do like. But uh, how they are made, how how the, uh, the film is crafted, it is very important. So, for example, um, I, I'm not very much for um, Marxist movies. I love Marxism. But, but when I see Syed Akhtar Mirza's movies, I'm completely spellbound. I'm completely spellbound. The way he's making movies, or Minal Sen, you are completely spellbound. So uh, the new uh, new wave will come. You cannot stop them. And uh, uh, it is very good. Uh, and you know how much <laughs> in lockdown period, how much uh, technically um, whatever we were told to go on and make PowerPoints and show this and that and etc., and um, how to go on link and zoom link and this and that. I learned everything I had to, even though I am not for it, but not, I don't like it very much, but I learned everything. And then, you know, sometimes it gave you a big high. You start enjoying also that medium. So as time passes, I told you, we are three genres, different genres belonging to in this house. But we, all the three of us are fine with each other. And uh, we can discuss about it, that why I like this and why he, and there is no antagonism to any medium that comes. It is only your preference. That's it. Some people like uh, very spicy. Some people like boiled food or some people like, you know, different type of people, different likings and different genres. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Um, thank you, Azar Saab. Thank you for all your questions. Um, so we are winding up the session. Uh, and participants uh, can correspond with the speaker through email, uh, which is yeah. in the chat. Box. Yeah, please do. If you have anything to discuss, please do. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. And over to you, Deepak. Request Sagar to please propose the vote of things. Over to you, Sagar. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, I would like to thank uh, speaker Dr. Amitha Valmiki for delivering such an amazing uh, lecture. I would also like to thank uh, Dean of our school, Professor Koshi Sarkhan, and uh, Vice Dean of our school, Professor Sanjot Ma'am, and all the other faculty members of the school. And uh, uh, I would also like to thank all the research scholars and students at our school, and all the participants from and outside Goa University. And 
lastly those who helped with the event promotion and carrying out this <coughs> event very smoothly thank you madam thank you so much thank thanks. you thanks a lot uh, dr amita <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity i don't know it made sense or not <laughs> i remember it was almost 3 4 years back you came to go yeah. on a, <laughs> Uh, in face uh, meeting a presentation yes, by yes. you yes yes and uh, also thanks to professor ranjit goes and many others who are here yeah actively participating but thank you so much for giving this opportunity really it means a lot to me and uh, please uh, let us be in touch with each sure. other yeah thank you so much thank you uh, thank you so we, much with this we have come to the end of our talk the recording of which will be available on our school youtube channel philosophy at goa university I hope to see you next month with another monthly guest lecture thank you thank you so much thank you so much bye bye